And this is the uh, Parks and Rec Advisory Committee meeting on the 27th of May, 20,000 or 2010, or something like that. And uh, let's start on this side of the side. Uh, my name is Patrick Sweeney, and uh, this is my first uh, first full meeting as a member. Uh, uh, Mitchell, uh, Mary Birch, Ed Shoemaker, member at large. Steve McAdoo. Hey, staff. Our staff. Call the meeting to order at about 11 after the hour. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, what we're looking at today and um, approval of minutes, I believe, is the first thing, and, and I believe we all had a chance to look at those, or did we? Yes. We can figure out how to do that. Again. Again. Agenda first. Good document. Okay, got it. I printed all this off. This is a cool technology. Well, I didn't print it because. Like you know, oh, yeah. one page away. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, I'll make a motion to uh, approve the minutes from the April 22nd meeting. I'll second it. Okay. All those uh, approved? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. All right. We have uh, approved the minutes uh, for our April 22nd meeting. And on to number three, which is citizen comments. Um, Brian, uh, we have a uh, man here on the back. Why don't you just up to pull up to one of those chairs there? While he's coming up, I'll introduce him. Um, this was not on your agenda, so I just encourage him to show up and we uh, kind of throw him in under the open part of the agenda here. Um, Josh Goldfinch is a young man who is um, an Eagle Scout, pursuing, pursuing finishing your Eagle Scout, so he needs to do a project. And has proposed to work with us on uh, doing a. He'd like to propose to do a disc golf course at Center Creek Park. And uh, Josh and Larry Potter and I met recently and kind of went over it a little bit. Um, but I want to steal the center. I'm going to let him kind of throw that at you. This would be an Eagle Scout project for him and would uh, potentially benefit us. And we thought it would be appropriate to have it come before you. And, let, let you all think about that a little bit and give us your feedback on it before we proceed any further. So, kind of pull up a little bit there, Josh, so they can hear your microphone, and then just go ahead and tell about your project. Mm -hmm. You didn't know that. Mm -hmm. well, well, sorry. In the back of your head is on TV. It's American Idol Rover. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I'm Josh Bullfinch, and uh, I'm going to be an Eagle Scout. I'm on Star right now. I'm in Troop 745, and uh, I wanted to put this uh, nine hole. Off, or Frisbee Golf Course or Disc Course in the Singer Creek Park. And then I drew up a uh, slide to draw. <laughs> Not a good artist, so this is kind of where the holes are going to be. That's the road over there on the right? Yeah, this is the road. Okay. Uh, so yeah. The arrow just says if it's going. Up an elevation or down an elevation. Mm -hmm. uh, all the boxes with the numbers are where the holes are going to be. What's the difference? Thank you. 
you have a question, Mr. Bagley? I do have a question. How many yards is the whole course going to be then? Uh, the whole course? Um, I haven't um, measured it, but it's an 18 acre park. Right, right. okay. Yeah. Good. Uh, there's, there's one of these at uh, Shampooey Park. I, you know, I've seen the little tower. That's, you're talking about the same sort of thing for the whole as the little. Um, I was going to do the like, official chain cage. Yeah, yeah. Chain chain cage. cage. Yeah, okay. One at MacIver too. They got 36 holes at MacIver. Or six. Mm -hmm. What? Uh, I have a couple times. Yeah. But Fun. I do it. So. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I've never played it. I heard it's real popular and a lot of fun. It is fun. It is a great, great game. Is it? Mm hmm. Um, Ultimate Frisbee is a uh, huge sport. Uh, uh, it's growing in large numbers. I've got many friends playing, and uh, this is a kind of a, a side project they love, they love to do. It's, mm -hmm. it's, on, it's on the rise. A lot of people do eagle projects where they just have a hand drive or they play. Items for a shelter, you know, and that's that's great. But I want something that could last a long time. So that's different. So, mm -hmm. so how did you come up with this idea? Well, there's a, a list of probably 250 projects, um, ideas. And I highlighted a couple, thought about some, and then I thought frisbee golf would be pretty cool. So. It would be a great addition to the parks around here. Definitely. And seeing a creek, you know, I mean, it's a nice little place to walk through, but it's not much going there. So d describe the, the implements or the, the fixtures that you put in place. Um, I was going to say pretty close to the, to the trail. So you can see most of the boxes are pretty close to the trail. Um, but, or if they're not by the trails, they're going to be by the, the trees in that big field, the middle. Well, yeah, I'm just trying to trying to vision when it's set up, um, how it's gonna, you know, what what the appearance is gonna be like for people going to the park. Is it gonna be kind of something you'll see, but it's kind of out of the way. It, it seems like when I've seen these before, in parks, they're kind of they're kind of permanent, but they are just kind of out of the way. Yeah, I mean, it will it would be permanent. You would uh, dig a hole and then put the pole in there and then put concrete. Or you could do um, tires with the pole and concrete, but that, that's mobile. So either way would work. So I was, I was going to put a sign next to the Cedar Creek sign. Right by the road is a, just a sign to the Cedar Creek. It's a, a board of the, a picture of a park and where all the holes are, so people mm -hmm. can kind of see where it is. Pretty good. So each hole will be numbered, of course. Yeah, one yeah, nine, yeah, and yeah, just like the golf hole will be numbered on all of them. Okay. And is there any parking issues for people wanting to? I have not. So parking is not very. Four or five. Yeah, that's, a, that's a question about that park in general, even without that. Because it, I mean, it's almost dangerous to try to find a place to park there. Most people ask this on walking, and it's a pretty mm -hmm. hairy walk right. up around the uh, around the bend on that highway. I do it. Mm -hmm. There's, there's a, a street right across the street. You could probably park on the side of the road. Is there a crosswalk from over there? Yeah. Across the street? Yeah, yeah, I believe so. Yeah, so that's where I think most people park is the little side weird yeah. street. Yes, yeah. that's, you're getting on um, some areas of um, discussion that we're having as well. This is a pretty recent proposal that just came forward and um, wanted to bounce it around here a little bit tonight and get some feedback and some concerns or ideas or thoughts or whatever. One of the things that we would need to do that uh, when Larry and I met with Josh is we told him that um, depending on how this kind of came out of this conversation that the design and, and all of the elements and, and everything would be subject to, to staff working closely with that and, and to make sure that it, things went into the right location and, and that type of thing. But I think for me, the biggest decision first is whether or not this is the right location as far as which park to put it in. Because it been, yeah. The park itself lends itself to really being a nice setup for this. It's kind of natural areas with some developed areas, um, you know, and, and it works pretty well with the disc golf. and probably would bring some folks into the park and you know, put a little bit of energy into that, that 
work, but it does tend to draw people in, and uh, people will drive to places to play disc golf once they find out they're there, especially since we've got very few of those around within the driving distance. So, so that's a pretty that's a pretty legitimate concern. So we're not. Really Second question is, uh, what is it going to do? I mean, have, have you looked at how many people can play on it before it starts actually, you know, destroying the grass or any of the well, that that's, uh, that's what we're going to try and stay on the pathway so that the natural areas don't harm it. There are some cliffs or whatever, or not cliffs, but canyons, I guess, that if you frisbee goes down there, And try and try and stay on the pathway. That's what I can. You want to throw a pretty straight? <laughs> did, 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 did you walk? Did you did you walk it and look at uh, the trees and the terrain? And you do. That'd be interesting to see. Like, do you think that the trees and the, and the way it's set up would be beneficial uh, for frisbee tossing? I mean, could you see it? Could you see the course when you're walking it? I mean, yeah. There's labels on the back of the pictures. So, in talking to you, Scott, about it, what other, what have your guys' thoughts been on a different location, or what would be maybe another option? Uh, I haven't really looked into other options, but maybe that's a, maybe that's something we could brainstorm a little bit. I'd be interested to see what, what you all would think about that. Uh, this is the only site that's been proposed, so kind of taking it from that point and then, and then working forward. And um, Josh, I don't know how much time you have to know what the decision is going to be. I know you need to complete this by this summer, I think, right? Yeah, I looked at um, probably four or five other parks, and I met with Larry probably a month ago. So all the parts I looked at were pretty busy. He's busy. He's at least busy for now. And there are some next year projects, whether you do it at this park or at another park. Is there any of these? It doesn't affect it. I just have to do it at the park 18. I wouldn't mind helping too with this if we're going to consider this. I wouldn't mind being put on track to kind of help us do this. I have a lot of interest in it. So I, wouldn't mind. I, I would love to volunteer with you too. Mm-hmm. But that's why I see it as being a, a boost for the community. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah, great idea. What kind of holes did you have in mind? This is a standard. Wooden or metal? You guys know? It has to be, but. Well, it doesn't last at all. Go ahead. All the materials have to be donated. So, I mean, pretty much whatever I get, I'll take. Like, uh, Are you guys familiar with the way it looks, the way a catch looks, or a basket, or a, I don't know what it's called in frisbee golf? Um, it has a pole coming straight up, uh, a little basket probably about two or three feet off the ground, so one pole buried into the ground, mm-hmm. and then above it is a dangling set of metal chains. So when the frisbee hits the chains, it absorbs and drops it right into the basket. Right? Is that did I get that correct? What would you say the diameter of it's circular, uh, one pole going in the ground, and the diameter is probably two feet? Two feet of the diameter if you're looking down at it. Two feet down at it. Well, I like it too, and, and you know, you know, as we talk about the safety concerns and the parking concerns, you know, one possible thing that might come up is the parking concern, um, and then there would be a constraint 
and uh, you know notes, whether it be online or wherever where, wherever this information will be accessed, that would be a clear uh, caution or a note when going to this park. There's there's a parking restriction off e even the even that side road, that one that's uh, up near the top. I don't know. That's obviously residential, and uh, I don't see tons and tons of cars on that residential street, but that's one other option. You could probably park a couple cars around the corner mm -hmm. and walk down that bike. I think it's a bike lane on that side of the road. Mm -hmm. So, and then there's maybe room for three cars in that little rock uh, parking area. So, yeah. right there on the land, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a housing development up at the top of the section, and there's a little pathway that just goes towards the park. And that's where I was planning on putting hole one. I mean, if you want to park all the way up there, right. I don't know how to get there. I like the idea too. My family would like to be involved, obviously. Mm -hmm. I guess I'll give you too much out because you know we want you to get your yeah. we'll call it a retirement <laughs> or your eagle. Well, basically, yeah. just the eagle project is just—it's like a leadership project. Mm -hmm. I can't really do any of the work. I do all the planning, all the paperwork, all the fun stuff. So I have to get volunteers and everyone to help. So. Okay. Cool. Well, I'll make Larry do a lot of work too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, uh, I, 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 I think it's a great idea. I think it's a great spot in the park. And I, I think it'd be nice to attract people to that park because it is beautiful and underused. I'm just really worried about the parking and the safety. And are we going to cause an aggravation to the neighbors as well with the cars coming in there? And, and you know, I, like I said, I'm torn. I think it's, it's a great, it's a great spot for it, and it would be a great addition to our parks. But I don't know how you get around that parking thing, and that's not a low-speed road either. So, increase of 35 once you break that. And I think the average is probably close to 40 or 45. Yeah, the neighbors. Yeah. yeah. The neighbors, yeah. yeah. Well, one thing that might flush out that that exact concern that you're bringing up, Mike, is that. Um, Again, we're in the really preliminary discussion stage here. It just kind of this just sort of came forward, and we're just kind of making the rounds of seeing what people think and so forth. Um, what, one thing that we would need to look into, and I don't know if, if you're if Larry mentioned this to you or not, Josh, but we may have to run this through our planning department to see if it required a site permit of any type or or some kind of a land use application. What kind of drives that is if you're if you're Significantly changing a use or, or making a, you know, an increase in use or something. I, I don't know whether this would trigger a review or not, but we would certainly we would have to check in on that end of things, and that actually could flush out some of that because then it becomes a little bit more of a public process where you have to go through a little site review and then and then the neighbors have the opportunity to make some you know input and comment and so forth. And, and again, I'm not sure that we have to do that, but that would be one thing that we would need to check on as to whether or not this is required. So I don't know the answer yet because we haven't gotten that far into the process. So, uh, Would you have any recommendations for Josh as far as being able to meet his timeline as far as getting you know approval with the city and what he would, might need to do and, you know, to avoid delays that would prevent him from getting started on time? I would suggest is that um, Josh would be in touch with Larry and we'll you know, be in close contact. Uh, um, if Steve and Patrick, if you guys wanted to be involved as well, it might be something that um, we could have a little group, quick group meeting here in the next week or two, mm -hmm. and, um, and then take some of this discussion a little bit further in terms of what do we need to do next, and and go forth from there. So I, th I think that's what we would do: is, is get back together, and then, like I said, I would invite Steve and Patrick if it worked with your schedules so we could set something up that works for you guys if you're interested. Just to kind of keep a practice representation on this thing would, would be, I think it would be really advisable. So. And keep it moving. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, thanks a lot, Josh. Good, good, good idea, Josh. Josh. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Josh. You might want to call up the phone call to Larry and then Okay, thanks again, Josh, and we'll move on to general business. 
for Alpha Oregon City Pool update. We have a special visitor brief for tonight, Rochelle Parsh. So come on up, Rochelle. Thanks for being here. Uh, most of you probably know Rochelle, but in case you don't, Rochelle is our aquatic and recreation supervisor. The majority of what she does is run our swimming pool and as well as some other duties, such as running our summer concerts in the park and some of those types of program things. But uh, as we talked about at the last meeting when Kathy came and gave you a report on the Pioneer Center, I'd like to periodically um, bring forward staff to give you reports on some of the different key areas of our operations so we can continue with that. We ask Michelle to come and give you some info tonight. Remember on your, uh, we're going to do the PowerPoint, you can switch the little clicker on the side of your monitors and it'll go over to the screen. So you don't have to twist your, your neck around. There we go. We can see it. Mm -hmm. It's on my screen. It's not projected. It looks like it might be warming up. Looks like the blue light shining through there. Well, she, you know, it just takes a while. <laughs> yeah, I sat, she sat here and waited for several seconds the last time. Really? You guys can see? Yeah. Okay. You can all see. Okay. So, um, my name is Rochelle Parsh. I am the Aquatic and Recreation Supervisor for the City of Oregon City. And um, what I'm going to talk about tonight is just give you guys a overview of the last five years, maintenance and programs um, that we offer specifically at the pool, um, where we were, where we are, and where we hopefully are going to go. Um, so about five years ago, the pool was on a pretty bad state as far as um, just the, the painting. It's a 1965-year-old pool, and so because of that, it obviously has the wear and tear of a 1965-year-old pool. Um, one of the things that was um, a priority right away was to get the facility professionally painted. And if you can see, they have the old facility paint and the new, the new facility paint. And, um, so it looks so much better professionally painted. Um, I always had my staff paint it, and so leaving that age group to pick the colors was kind of an interesting an interesting project. So now it really has consistency throughout the whole building. It just looks really good. And the total cost of that project was about $25,000. And the next thing we identified was updating both the, the locker rooms, the pool deck, and then, as you can see in the bottom right picture there, the old picture of the office. Um, because it is a 1965-year-old pool, the locker rooms really looked four years old, four to five years old. And not only did it look that, but it also created a safety issue. It's exposed to plus, and it's pretty slick when it gets wet. And so we brought in somebody and they put in um, new flooring and it's a slip resistant coating. Um, it just, it really looks really, really good. And we hear such positive feedback from the patrons. It's, it's pretty great. And that total project was about $30,000 to do that. Another thing we identified was um, a much needed new roof. And that building had, as you can see from the old pictures, just Pooling on top of the facility, and because of the pooling on top of the facility, um, it's not an exaggeration. We literally we had leaks in the auditorium, we had leaks in the offices, we had leaks in the community room, and um, it's funny now because it doesn't leak. But at the time when it would rain pretty heavily, literally the auditorium would drip rain into the pool onto the patrons while they were swimming laps, and so you guys. Yeah, right. That's neat. You had a pool on the roof, right. which was cool, right. and then you had raindrops. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's like a lot pool. Right. Yeah, and so yeah, we. Yeah, you'll have to. Well, I still got a best time in that pool. <laughs> That's awesome. Very nice. Yeah, so we um we got that upgraded and updated, and that project was about three hundred thirty-two thousand dollars. We also put new HVAC units on the roof too. Energy efficiency HVAC units. Um, I can tell that just the difference as far as regulating the temperature in my office is wonderful. Um, the community room has regulated temperatures. It's just it's such a great improvement. And once you <coughs> fix the shell of the facility, it really, really lends itself to fixing the inside of the facility. So, um, other projects that we completed in the last five years, and 
these are just to name a few. When I actually sat down and looked at all the projects we've done the last five years, we've probably done over 50 different improvements and upgrades to the facility in the last five years. Um, so in 2006, 2007, we had an energy efficiency program implemented, and our annual energy savings from this energy efficiency program is about $16,000 a year. And the total cost of the project is $106,000 with a payback period of three and a half years. So we've already paid that project back. And some of the things that are, were included in that energy efficiency program were um, UV lighting system, which is a chemical um, a way to treat the water with UV lighting. So we save on chemicals, things like that. Pool blankets that cover the pool so we don't have to heat the pool as much. Um, and we upgraded our HVAC system. Like I said, what we did is we took um, systems that weren't on computer systems and we we put them so we could program them. Where our boil, boiler used to run 24 hours a day, now it's programmed so it runs between heating and the water when we need to heat it. Uh, it's, it's just, it's great. It really is a great system. So in 2008, 2007, we carpeted the hallways, repaired um, a waiting pool leak that we had, um, repaired a, the slide. Um, there was a crack in the slide, so we repaired that, and we actually moved it over to a lot five-story block, and we upgraded to new ADA stairs on the bottom left there. So in 2008, 2009, we replaced hallway windows, facility fencing, um, problematic trees in front of the facility, and purchased new tables and chairs for the community room. In 2009, 2010, we purchased an ADA lift, and um, that's in the upper left-hand corner there. You can see that we used to have one of the, the basket ones that just had a battery on it. it. So this is great. It's battery operated. Um, we removed the concrete overhang over the high dive and repaired um, and altered the location um, of the diving board. And so, like I said, I was only to name a few of the, some of the 50 that we've accomplished over the, the course of five years. Um, total that we've spent so far is about $560,000 on the repairs. And um, the, the thank you really has to go to the city commission and, and, and you guys for the support and hopefully continued support and the foresight of. Um, Scott and Denise to see the potential on a, a facility that is a 1965-year-old facility. Um, and, and truly, so much of aesthetic has to go credit to Denise because I, she's got like, this awesome way of seeing colors. And Kathy and I was laughing because we used to have everything band-aid. If it were on the house, we'd be like, or I had everything blue. I was like, cool, it should be blue. <laughs> so, it's, no, Denise has got an awesome eye for that stuff. So, it, it's pretty cool to see those upgrades. So, um, and so a little bit about this. so some of this was um, completed through contingency funds. Some of it was fundraising, um, and then our annual is kind of the history of what we've had to work with is about twenty-two thousand to thirty-eight thousand dollars. And for the 2010, 2011 funds available, we've got about thirty-nine thousand dollars to work with. And a lot of that funding just helps maintain a 1965-year-old facility, just with um, things that happen throughout the year. So we have boilers. Pursue any other um, future upgrades and improvements. There'll have to be um, alternate sources of whether it's fundraising or contingency funds. So, um, okay, so where we hope to go. So what we're hoping for the next five years. Um, these are kind of some of the, the the pictures that stand out as far as where we need to go facility wise. Um, in 2010, 2011, we're hoping to repair. There's two natatorium fans that will help the circulation within the natatorium area, and that also actually helps water clarity and water. Um, replace the flooring in the hallways in the community room, and you can see in the pictures there the divider in the community room is um, pretty stressed looking. It'd be really great eventually to get a new divider. And then um, our flooring in the hallways, we are using tape to hold down some of the teeth of the flooring that's coming up. So that'd be great to do that in 2010, 2011. And then there's a really neat patio space off of the waiting pool area that would be um, really neat. 2011, 2012, we're going to complete, um, hopefully complete the community room repairs. So the kitchen in the upper right is a very dated um, kitchen. It would be great to update that and add some different things that will allow for more rentals and more revenue when it comes time. Um, just paint the, the facility upper walls and ceiling, and then remove and replace acoustical tiles. So you can see in the picture that our acoustical tiles are being worn. And it'd be great to remove those just as a really neat and um, aesthetically pleasing and enhance the rest of the wall. Some of the better tiles, actually. It is just true. <laughs> 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 um, 20, 2015, new lockers. We have um, worn metal lockers that are rusty, so every year my staff goes goes to town at home. 
the rest staff. They don't work quite right, so it'd be great to get your lockers. Um, add down to SNED, Victoria Bands, new ladder to the Nine Prime Roof, and then 2013 14 would be great to replace the boiler. Add a really good functioning boiler. And 2014 and 2010, addressing the ADA upgrades that go along. And the interesting thing is, in 2007, there was a pool facility evaluation, and if all of the maintenance issue, issues were to be addressed in this pool facility evaluation, it would be about another $402,000 to $602,000 grant would be one of the grants. So, we're there. Um, the cool part about these upgrades is just the feedback that we're getting from the community. And um, it's really been neat to see the transition when I got on board um, about four or five years ago now, and just to see how the communities responded to these. And, um, some of the quotes that I've gotten from patrons, um, one since 1983 states, I've been swimming 20 laps a day, um, about five days a week since my open heart surgery, and my cardiologist had a successful recovery to this back. The Oregon City Pool is one facility that citizens can be very proud of. It's clean and bright. It's had a both professional, helpful, and cheery. Among the many helpful programs provided, but the most important one is teaching the children of the community how to swim. And another patron since 1987 states, so who's actually a patron in a very public health way. My greatest good has been the companionship of so many people. The pools in Iris Street several years ago was predicted, predicted to be closed. My dream of the Oregon City Pool is that it would be a tragedy to close the building and its programs, especially for younger children who learn to swim in the many classes. It's really a family atmosphere there, and it's really neat to see the community. Um, we appreciate these upgrades. So. Um, next, I'm going to talk about programs and attendance and what it means to invest in a community pool with these programs. Okay, so currently we've got 43 aquatic staff and five seasonal recreation staff. And something interesting about the aquatic staff is they handle all program registrations, facility reservations, high party, and te they teach swimming lessons. So when I hire somebody on, not only are they required to lifeguard, to receive that certification, but teach swim lessons and the phone, they have to understand exactly all that we offer through parks and recreation and um, some of the programs we offer through the recreation programs that are actually held at the facility. We've got our karate class at the facility, summer camps, dog classes, we have fencing class, indoor playground, and then satellite sites, we've got tennis, sky hockey, and the daddy daughter dinner. So my staff has to respond to all of these questions and, and they go out and lifeguard and then teach swimming lessons. So it's, it's a big deal. It's a big responsibility for 16, 17 year olds and I have some other people on staff too. So it's, it's a lot for them to learn. It's a good first stop. So, um, aquatic program held at the facility. We've got swimming lessons, water exercise classes, school swim program, aquatic special events, lifeguard classes, and CPR for the state. Um, an interesting fact about um, for the month of April, we have 785 phone calls. We have 3,420 face-to-face customer service interactions. So this is where we respond to questions. Uh, it's not just our regular, hello, welcome to water exercise. It's actually the interaction you might have seen. But like I said, a question, or we have to point them in the right direction. So that's, that's a lot. And all my staff have face-to-face -face interactions. And then 140 internet registrations. Well, how many school districts come down for the, for the school classes? Yeah, we partner with so all of the Oregon City School District 62 come down. So we have 16. And we have five um, between the home school, we have St. John's, we have some private schools that come in too. So that we have But it's just Oregon City. Mm -hmm. yeah, and we'll do some like other surrounding ones, but yeah, like Candy Lane will come in. Our estimated annual visits are going to be about 148,728. So this is an average um, visit of about 12,394 a month. And our revenue for 0809 was uh, 269,000. So if you look at that compared to four years ago, our approximate um, annual visits were about 87,000, and our revenue was 219,000. So when you look at the increases, um, it's 41% increase in visits per year and 18.5% increase in revenue. Well, that just, it just goes to show, I mean, I, that I think a lot of the attendance and revenue increases can be attributed to, um, like, the additional water exercise classes. We went from five, we currently have ten. 
Um, we added additional uh, lab and adult gym time as we restructured the swim lesson program. When I got on board, we worked at American Red Cross, we currently are. So because of American Red Cross swimming lessons, um, it's a more structured program that all the instructors go through is uh, a 37 hour training. We're more reputable of a program, so people send their kids there. It's great. Um, we increase their advertisement. We have additional community room and pool rentals, facility improvements, and then community partnerships. And community partnerships are really, really important to us because without the community support, um, you know, it wouldn't be the facility that it is right now. So, give us some of the community partnerships. So, the Oregon City School District. Up this community college, we partner with them. They send kids down, and we actually have a curriculum they can get credits for participating in our water activities. Alliance Carter Academy, which is um, the homeschool group, Boy Scouts of America, Easton Community School. We partner with Easton Community School through some lessons, recreation swim, summer camp programs. So we have a really close relationship with the community. Um, the Oregon City Swim Club. Um, both high school teams, 4-H, various neighborhood associations, and then all summer camp concert sponsors. And that leads into my um, next slide. This year we have $10,550 of sponsorships um, for the summer concert series. We have 14 total, which is a record. You know, that's great. We have a lot of people step forward and sponsor the concerts this year, which just goes to show that this free summer concert is really, really important to the community, and bringing people into this one area to enjoy the free music. So average attendance per concert is about 750, and the total summer visits approximately about 9,000. And this is the list of who's playing this summer. So it looks fun. Check it out. Yeah. Fun. So um, thank you for your time today and letting me be uh, happy to with some of one-on-one. -on -one. I have to I have to admit I, I don't know how this how the fee structure works and I apologize for thinking like an accountant which I'm not but I kinda of think that way. Forty one increase forty one percent increase in visitors and eighteen percent increase in revenue, which tells me that you gain less revenue per person that's visiting the pool, is there any, been any thought to, you know, ways to, we could be increasing wear, more wear and tear on the pool with that many more visitors, but they're not generating as much revenue as they used to. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good thought. Um, one of the things that we, we raise our admission fees every three years, and our still some of those programs every year. So maybe one line of thought would be looking at raising the fees. Our rates currently right now are um, they're on kind of the the lower end, middle end of where other facilities are. So I mean that that could be an option. Yeah, I'm not, I don't want to make it unaffordable. I'm not trying to propose that. It just caught my eye that those are kind of out of proportion. Yeah, I just added that too. Um, the the equating the visits to those every every visit directly paying for the service. It's not those visits are. Correct me if I'm wrong, Michelle. I think this is correct. Are incorporated in each time a person comes for, say, one of their swim lessons or yeah, swim lessons. Yeah. So, several visits might be one from one registration. Okay. So, wouldn't the percentage wouldn't go up as much as I don't know if what I'm saying makes sense. Yeah, it does in my mind. But so you yeah. Like yeah. yeah. So you might have only the swim lessons might have gone up two bucks since that last. Comparison, but there might be this, whatever. So it's so it's not a one-to-one -one ratio, and and then the other part of it is kind of more the philosophical piece, which is the finding the balance of um, how much how much is paid for by the patron, how much is paid for by the city, what's affordable. You know, we're constantly kind of working towards that, finding the balance of what the market will bear, but not pricing people out of the market because unlike a regular private entity, um, swimming pools traditionally are subsidized by the cities or the park districts or whatever the agency happens to be. Um, that's why you don't see too many standalone swimming pools that are just a private business. They might be a part of something like they're part of a health club or 
amenities, you know, like part of a hotel or part of a health club or part of a of a, of a huge uh, water park or some type of something like that. But other than that, just standard um, municipal pools like we operate wouldn't they wouldn't um, be able to survive without some level of subsidy. So it, it's a, that's a that is something that we're constantly grappling with is that kind of that fine line of providing the both the recreation but also the, the, the fitness and the life saving services that the pool provides. But also trying to recoup as much of the revenue as we think we can as we can realistically get. So yeah, it's a good question and it's one that we constantly look at with our program staff, and especially with the pool. Well, and, and the and the key thing is what does it take for for sustainability, right? Unlike a private entity, which is for profit, I mean, you're getting great utilization out of the facility. Um, you know, it's in, in much better condition. I don't, I don't know if I want to say great condition. I mean, it's great condition compared to where it was before. But um, yeah, are you able to sustain it with what you're bringing in? I wanted to tell you too. Um, I I grew up going down to that pool as a kid and I would do swimming lessons through elementary school in Oregon City and those are great members not only in school but um, you know just, just utilizing it for recreation birthday parties down there my kids have also done the same thing and um, I just I want to applaud you for, for your work down there because that is I mean it's really in the community I mean, it's exceptional to have something like that available, and they're just, they're just great memories and, and excellent activities. And that that place is just—I I hear nothing but great things about it, and you know, it's just, it's really it's really nice to have. I used to ride my bike to that swimming pool from Gladstone. Did you? Like the parade or something? I tell you what, what year that was exactly, but I have those kind of memories too. It's it's pretty amazing that. This many years later, or whatever, we're still it's basically the same place. The only thing that's different is we used to have the height I had to jump off of, and that was the cool, really cool thing. But I had a pretty red belly in that thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, and unlike you, Scott, I'm older than, than that pool uh, a little bit. Um, almost. almost oh, no. <laughs> but speaking of, of going to the pool, I, I remember walking to the pool from the top of the hill in Oregon City. And boy, did I get in trouble because mom, mom didn't know I was going to take that on myself. That's I was probably more like six or something. But anyway, good, good thing I'm done. Thank you. Okay, uh, I think we're about to go to lunch. Okay. Our next item is War Bravo. Center utilization process, and we have not had a meeting since the last uh, time we met. I think there was one coming in June. But the great thing that you can tell us, Scott, on that is no changes or definite dates coming up. Yeah, um, Denise, feel free to take on anything I've, I've got here, but uh, again, this is just an item to keep as a rolling agenda item so that you're, you're very much aware of any anything new. Um, I think the task force is set to meet again on June 14th. Does that sound right? There's a recent email that just went around, so. June 24th. And then. I guess that's something wrong with that. That July, that July workshop. Yeah, at any rate, there's going to be a meeting in June, as Brian already said, and, um, and then working towards a report to the city commission in, in July. So things are still moving. The. Um, I don't recall if at our last crack meeting we had talked about the library piece of it and whether that decision was made or was not. I, I kind of, there so many meetings blend together. It wasn't made. Okay. But I think I said things were moving that direction. Yeah, moving in that direction. Okay, so then the update on that would be um, the, the decision has been made that the library will move into the Carnegie Center on a temporary basis for a, a period of, I think, approximately a year. You, you may or probably know the city has um, approved a purchase sale agreement with the school district for the Easton building. Um, that agreement is still pending on a number of contingencies on basically like the city being able to 
get the necessary zoning and permitting that we need to change the use of that facility into a, a future library building. But you know, hopefully things will go in the right direction there. We've, um, as you know, the, the Danielson Center where the library currently resides is, is completely being renovated and changing, and we will no longer have our library space there. So that kind of forced the city's hand to have a um, an interim facility between between now and when uh, the library can move into the Easton building. The only for the city uh, in the, the the staff and the, and the city commission made the decision that they're really the only logical solution was to move into the, the Carnegie Center. It wasn't ideal in terms of size or you know a lot of those types of things, but it was a building that the city already owned. It was vacant. Otherwise, we would have had to go out and, and find another facility and pay rent or a lease or something to that effect. So that decision was made. The library would be moving into the Carnegie Center, I think, in late June. And then uh, uh, it'll operate there basically until the time that they can move to the Easton building. As far as the, the tie in here to, the, to this task force process that, that's been going on, um, it's really important for the task force and for PRAC and for the community to understand that process has not been negated in any way by the fact that the library is going to be moved in in, in an interim basis. What it does do is it slides back the ability to implement the action that will be recommended from the task force. It moves that timeline back. Um, but the commission is still very much looking forward to the report from the task force and the consultant about what are the recommendations. Um, on the plus side, I guess it gives the city a little bit more time to figure out how to get those things in place, whatever that's going to end up being, which is probably you know, some type of a community center facility with some of the things I know Brian's giving you frequent reports on what, what some of the thoughts are there. So um, so that's the latest. And uh, anything else, Denise, you can think of? Okay. So, yeah, that's really just kind of an update for your information so you're aware of what's going on. And then I think by our next PRAC meeting, yeah. we'll have an update from another oh, task force meeting. Yeah, we'll have a good update yeah. on that. Thank you, Scott. And an update also on the Kenema Park grant application there. Again, uh, something that we kind of just been, I've been keeping you posted on. We've got a, uh, a grant application into the um, Oregon State Parks through the local government grant program, which has funded some of our park projects here. Um, we have a presentation to the committee that makes that decision on June 9th. So that committee meets, it's like a three day process because they have. There are dozens of projects from around the state that get submitted. It takes, it takes three days. And we're, our project gets presented in, in just one 20-minute like time slot. But there are so many projects that they do that over a three-day period. It may meet over in the Bend area. And uh, so I will be going over there and um, presenting that at our application on behalf of the city. And we'll be doing a PowerPoint presentation. And, and then sometime in July, we find out if we get the grant or not. So it's a very competitive process. There are many, many more projects than there are dollars available for. We think we've got a good project. Um, hopefully the committee will find, uh, find its way to thinking that as well. So I'll, at the next next PRAC meeting, I don't know if I'll have much more to report other than I will have given this presentation, but we won't have a decision until sometime in July. So I look forward to giving you some some additional reports on that when we have some information. We asked about the, the grant writing process with Metro, how that went. I assume it went well. Yeah, it went, it went good. Mm -hmm. I think we talked about going and looking at Kanima as part of our park tour, which we're going to talk yeah. about probably towards the end of this agenda tonight. So we'll make sure you get a chance to look at that park if you're not familiar with that. I know we looked at the little drawing of the of the master plan, but um, seeing it on the ground is a lot, it's a lot more different for you, really. Concept of what's going on. And we also got a really good update on the trail uh, in front of the signage design. And we got to see pictures last time, but was there more information on that? Uh, nothing has really changed for, um, since that time. Uh, none of the, the design hasn't really changed. Um, the, the big issue is getting through all of our permit processes. We have to, because of the 
piece up here on the McLaughlin Promenade, there's a lot of uh, historic review and sensitivity there involved. So we've had to go through the process of reviewing that with our city's historic review board. And those, those uh, reviews have gone well. Denise might have a little bit more input on that one because you actually were at one of those or Laughlin Neighborhood Association meeting. Our consultant that's helping us design those. Um, and he did a, a really nice presentation and they were very receptive. Um, they really liked the design and that we mimicked the McLaughlin. Forward with the HRV here. The seat in that will also be the benches and garbage cans. Already damaged some of our locations. And remind me, is, it, is the memorial also included? Uh, that will be included, and they made a presentation to that effect, and they were very pleased with the way that. Um, Translated out as far as the design picture that will be included. Concept and will definitely be designed as far as I know we talked about the location for that memorial. Has that been decided? So. On the 5th Street side? On the 5th Street um, point where the flagpoles and the benches kind of sit, and then there's that viewpoint where there's also a, an older monument. Hopefully by the next meeting we'll be able to say that maybe our all of our projects are approved and we'll be getting ready for the manufacturer to put some nice new signage and I think when we get that project in it's really gonna be it's really gonna add a lot to the to the promenade up there. Eventually yeah, complement all the work that we're that we're doing currently and restoring the the promenade. And how's that is that just about ready to wrap up? I, I noticed the close to the last segment. And um, I don't remember the completion date. I think it's I think it's early summer. Um, if I'm not mistaken, but I, I, I'm not 100 percent sure. I've, I've got that information somewhere. I can let you know that's going to be. But yeah, they're getting kind of on the on the home stretch here. So. We can maybe talk about talk about that at our June meeting yeah. about uh, yeah. yeah. That's great. Interesting. They um, they're. You, you can see they're completed, you know, quite a ways past Fifth Street, you know, heading heading yeah. south, and then they got blocked off for pedestrian mm -hmm. traffic. And then I was up there tonight, and then I can see where it's also completed beyond that point. So they've got a section in the middle that they're still working on. I kind of thought they were working north to south. I would think that the first yeah, the the south. Yeah, the, 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 uh, yeah. the Sure, what their what their process is there, but there's some logic to how that staging works out. But uh, yeah, it's staged a little differently than I would have expected. But there's a lot done. They're doing a great job too. I've, I've walked up and down the park, and it's some really good quality stuff. And I, I think they're working pretty fast. I can't remember the date I saw a date on it. Was, Shocking, like, wow, a whole year. Like, I can't remember how long the first initial sign they put out, uh, but they seem to be working a lot faster. I just can't remember that thing. Where is the process of selecting the bunch of Historically correct, it's going to take a lot of measures to make sure that happens. It's also very encouraging, you know, including this building, all the things that are happening in. in on this the improvements and the historical context of everything and where we're sitting. And that wasn't the original location for the for uh, McLaughlin House, but 
know, there it is right there and, and uh, everything else around us. And instead of, uh, you know, things deteriorating as they do over the years, uh, we're doing something in Oregon City about it. And I think it's something to be really proud about. I certainly am. Mm -hmm. on to four foxtrot and I use those uh, or uh, I see echo I'm sorry echo <laughs> okay <laughs> get ahead of yourself fly. look at the fly and I know that we had a couple people go to that meeting didn't Ray attend that meeting with you Ray, Ray was not able to not there okay so maybe we could get an update from you on that <clears throat> and it was the um, the kickoff meeting for the ESC task force mm -hmm. And this was this was a meeting I was really uh, kind of curious to see how this thing would go. Um, there was about 30, 30 people there, I would say, in, in, the, in this room with um, with the consultant group and representation from you know, all around the community. Of course, uh, you know the mayor was here and, and representatives from um, CHP and um, Clackamas County. Um, Promotion, tourism is what I'm thinking of. Right, right. They were here. It's kind of it's kind of marketing for Clackamas County, um, and uh, Rocky Smith County Commissioner was here. Um, and really, what they what the, the majority of the time spent was just brainstorming from from the group of people as to what um, what people's vision is for that for that area and what um, you know what people's opinions are on what would be a workable um, site down there you know workable as far as something that's going to be sustainable and that's going to have enough um, attraction to to draw people and, and and really stimulate people so um, a lot of great ideas um, and so the consultants gathered up all this information. They're going to kind of uh, come back um, at the next meeting, and we're going to roundtable some more about um, what would be, uh, you know, I, I think some ideas that um, that would have legs that would really that would be a workable scenario down there. First, first step in the process, but a lot of, a lot of good ideas and. A lot of real passionate people about about making that a workable site. Down there. The consultants are they similar to the Carnegie? The, who are the consultants that are being? Is this the same firm that um, was, was doing the park place? Um, no. I, I didn't. They're doing the Carnegie that are helping with the city with the Carnegie process is the same one that did. This is, that's the, 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 the park place. This is a different group. A different firm. Um, I'm not remembering the name off the top of my head, but it's a consultant that, that basically specializes in heritage facilities and facilities like like the EOT site and, and those kind of things. They're a, a national firm. Name if I think of it all. Okay. Yeah, I think yeah. I can name this. This I was really fascinated. If they were the same group with the Carnegie. That's yeah. different. Yeah. That was a different consultant. So was there talk of changing what the end of the Oregon Trail Center provides, uh, you know, the product it provides, or, or, or no? I, I think the majority of the talk was was keeping what it provides, but making it more interactive. So, you know, I think I think one of the one of the ideas talked about that I think a lot of people really kind of felt made sense was something like a market type of environment um, where where people come in and they you, you might have uh, interactive pioneer um, events going on you um, might have food preparation in an area you might have a little market where you're selling food in another area but really just preliminary discussion but the idea was what can you do I mean the, the real um, thing that I think everybody was trying to accomplish is what can you do to make that appealing for people to not only want to visit, but to be able to come back, come back right. and show an interest from, you know, from from out of this area? 
I should be well. I'm, I'm on a learning curve here. I'll, I'll get down there and make that right. Scope it out. But is it a big property? Is it lots of parking and yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It is. So there's many multiple uses probably that came up that could be used for. Well, and another one of the one of the questions um, that came up that was kind of interesting is how do you make it fit with what's already there? And that, that's mm -hmm. that's going to be a challenge, I think. They've already gone ahead with you know a lot of development down there, and there's plans for, for more in, in, in the general area. So, you know, what, what you want to do with that area? How is that? How is that going to fit in with what's existing down there? And, uh, and future stuff like the rivers. Well, yeah. I mean, that area has a lot of potential in the future. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, and I'm not sure that failed. Uh, yeah, that's the call there. That's the answer. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I'm looking forward to the next meeting to see what uh, the co consultants bring back. And, and yeah, as you mentioned, Scott, you know their their experience is with this type of thing, and um, so I think they're going to have some good feedback for the group and to to kind of build on. So. What about possible overlap of what the Carnegie Center may um, become or um, what we already have at uh, our other museums? Does that come up at all? And I know that's come up in the, in the task force, the Carnegie task force. Is, well, we already have this, these things. Uh, do we want to be different or? I don't remember that specifically coming up, but one of the one of the important points was how do you integrate Oregon City and the history of Oregon City um, you know, with this site, and I told the story about you know people coming to Oregon City and how Oregon City grew to where it is today, which you know really would include that. So. Any other questions? Hard, hard to be specific. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. And that is yeah. brainstorming. Yeah. 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 Really, we're really interesting. Yeah. And 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 personally, I don't I don't know. How you make this thing, you know, it, I don't know if you can accomplish, you know, at the level that the community would like or, or that this group would like to see. Um, you know, whether or not that's feasible, I don't know. Um, but I, but I like the fact that um, you know the city is investing the, the time and energy to, to to take the best shot at it. <coughs> And just to clarify, Scott and Denise, yes. this, this is our, you know, this is under our purview now. Since it had been turned over to the, the city and the purview essentially of the. So, um, yes, that's, that's basically that's correct. It is um, property and the facilities are city owned. They've been previously managed by the Clackamas Heritage Partners, and then it was the something different before they changed the name to Clackamas Heritage Partners. Um, the, the, um, the way that that language worked with those agreements with that organization was basically if, if they ever ceased to operate those facilities, they would fall back to the city. We didn't really hope that that would happen or expect that that would happen. So, you know, quite frankly, it's been, it's been a pretty big um, responsibility to drop back onto the city's lap, uh, both from uh, management and just, just figure out what to do, hence that's why we're going through this process, but also from the resources the perspective that, you know, we're maintaining those facilities now. There's the, um, there's something I think is worth pointing out too, you've got the interpretive center piece, which are the wagons, and then you've got the visitor center building, the VIC, Visitors Information Center. That's one of the, that, that's still an active um, and open location that the way that works is the city owns that. The, our city commission, even though we closed the interpretive center, we didn't close it, but it closed and we're working on figuring out what to do with that part of it. The visitor center has never closed. Um, that's a site where, you know, one of the, like the county tourism kinds of centers. The operations are funded by the county tourism development commission, but it's owned by the city. 
they've done that through contracting with some, with actually Clackamas Service Partners, were the ones that have been, have still been running that with the county support, maybe looking at changing how that's operating in the next month. But that continues to be open. So that's kind of an interesting dynamic as well. And it's, the, the, our, our city commission feels pretty strongly about keeping that open, even though trying to figure out what to do with the rest of it, because that's a, it's a really important focal point for people coming into the community to figure out where they want to go and recreate and play and spend their money and shop and all those kinds of things. So the county continues to, to support that operation. So. Now we can move on to Fox Trap. Parks and Public Space Utility Fee. I think that's the first time I've seen that. Yeah. Probably is. This is something I, I think I've, I may have mentioned this once or twice way, you know, back when or whatever, but um, really wanted to just put this on as a uh, kind of as a heads up and a potential future discussion with Prack. Um, the. Uh, through the last couple of, of cycles we've had with our budget committee, you know, one of the one of the ongoing issues is how do you how do you continue to financially make the, the maintenance of a parks and recreation department sustainable? It's um, we and, and I think we've talked about this in this in this committee. We've got a not just our day to day operations. You know, we maintain. 37 parks and all the facilities. Rochelle just talked about, you know, one of our highest maintenance need facilities, um, and, and keeping care of all those parks on a day-to-day -day basis, just keeping them clean and green and mowed, basically. But we've also got this backlog of deferred maintenance that, you know, if traditionally, unfortunately, the city had, had not done a great job of sort of keeping up with the park system and the infrastructure. So, for example, our trails in the parks, uh, concrete and asphalt paths that you walk on. You'll notice that some of our older parks are all buckled and pushed up, and a lot of them are unfortunately in pretty bad condition. Uh, you know, some of our, our our tennis and basketball courts are in the greatest shape. Um, some of our restrooms need to be replaced. All of our sprinkler systems are you know aging, and a lot of those need to be replaced. So that, anyway, there's just this. We've estimated that we've got a backlog of deferred maintenance of somewhere between about seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars upwards of potentially up to a million dollars. That's not going forward on the day-to-day -day operations. That's going backwards. Like, how do we catch up with all the all of these problems? So, um, and we've had this conversation through the last couple of budget cycles with our uh, our city budget committee, and this just came up again through our last budget cycle, which the committee meetings took place last month, and. Uh, the idea or the concept that keeps kind of bubbling up to the surface is what about the idea of, 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 gener of creating a park and public utility fee, pub park and public space or park and open space utility fee. And what that is is we've got we've recently in the last uh, about a year ago or so, the, the city enacted through the city commission um, a pavement, pavement maintenance utility fee. I don't know if you look closely on your utility bills when you get your your water and your sewer bill from the city. There's a little line that should say something to the effect of pavement maintenance fee. And that's a, a new fee. It's actually a utility fee because streets streets are considered a utility, and there's a little bit extra you pay each month. And, and the concept there is that that the, the, the street department has, has the same issue. Um, that how do we how do we keep you know up with all of these streets? We have we have our SDCs. The system development charges, but those are only for new or or expanded development. Can't go and typically use that because of restrictions in the state law of how SDCs are spent. Can't use that for, for maintenance. Can only use that for new development. And so basically, for us to take care of all this stuff, it's all general funds. So there's been this discussion. It's kind of gotten a little bit more serious, and that's why I'm bringing it to you so that as this as this conversation starts to move forward, um, that We'll keep track in the conversation, and, and you'll have some input along the way. But the idea of creating this uh, a utility fee for for parks and open spaces, and um, as a way to basically generate some funding for ongoing ongoing support, uh, as well as dealing with the backlog of, of maintenance that we've got. Um, at this point, it's just a very very preliminary conversation. 
uh, to go forward with this, what you have to do is develop a methodology of, of what you'd like to accomplish, how much that would be, and over over you know over what amount of time you want to you want to implement that fee, and, and you sort of have to develop a, this methodology, which at the outcome of that methodology, you come up with some some ideas of what that number might be, and, and then start to talk about whether that's palatable or not with the, with the residents and what the what the community will support, what the commission is is willing to enact or not. And uh, anyway, that's that's something that will be in. It's the budget committee urges us to, to have this conversation before the next budget cycle next year and to um, seriously consider moving this idea forward. Um, so it's something that I've been given some direction on, you know, begin to craft some, some concepts, begin to have that conversation, and that will kind of make its way through the channels. And again, um, that will be something that you'll will definitely be hearing from me about and we'll be seeking your input and, and presenting some information and ideas on that. So um, that's just kind of an introduction of that. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those and we'll, we'll be talking about this more in the future as well. So is implementing a council decision or does that go to a public vote? It's a council decision. Um, it is a it is considered a, a fee, not a tax, because you're paying it as a utility fee. There's state laws that allow this to happen. Actually, a lot of uh, a lot of cities charge utility fees for things like roads, parks, um, other types of infrastructure, um, and it it's it's a council and enacted type of uh, type of a fee. So most of our neighboring cities around here. Uh, I don't know about the parks. I know that West Lynn does have a parks maintenance fee. They they were one of the first actually in the state. Um, the city that I most recently worked for, the last city that I worked for before I became I came here to take this position in, in Medford, uh, when I was there, uh, we had just recently enacted a parks fee. And that's been quite successful. They've actually built some, built some really interesting, innovative things with that. Um, there are a number of other cities. I don't know how many of our neighboring cities that do have that. And, and also there are fees for different things, not just parks, but like I said, some things like roads and, and some other things. So that's part of going to be part of our research is, is going out and figuring out who all does that and, and do some comparing and, and start an out, you know, doing some analysis. So certainly several do. Yeah. This is like the other utility fee. There would be a comment period and, and uh, they want feedback from the, the community, yes? Yeah, that would be, I mean, the, the public process part of that would be that the commission would be taking that action and they would be seeking feedback as we go forward. Um, the public works department, when they went forward with their, their pavement maintenance fee, um, I know that our city commission held a number of public hearings on that. They, they sought a lot of feedback. They, they really kind of went back and forth a lot on, on what they're to charge and what not to charge, but they got a lot of feedback on it. You know, there, like I said, there are a lot of considerations, like what, what amount of utilities are people already paying, and you know, whether all, all, all the other city and county taxes that you're paying, and for your local services, and what, what, what's the priority on services is really what the question is. Are you, are, you know, ultimately the question is, does our, does our commission feel that it's a priority to ask for a few more dollars from from people in their in their utility payment to, to support the service, and that, that's where you kind of get into the Data, whether it's important to go forward with it, how much you would charge, and, and so forth. So, creates inter interesting conversation, for sure. And that's the kind of information I think that would be really helpful for me to be able to to help support something like that. Certainly, um, if 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 there's an opportunity to help that park budget, and and that would help out that whole program with the parks and, and really help help the city that way, I'd be all for that, but it'd be hard to uh, recommend that without that budget information, you know, income and expenditures. Yeah, and as this develops, too, I mean, one of my interests would be, it would be easy for us or for the citizenry of Oregon City to, to be more favorable toward this if it was, it was for certain, certain known um, Projects, so to speak. And, uh, that's and I'm sure that would be part of. Go ahead. Yeah, that's um, exactly right. And that's the 
that's the methodology, and that's actually the technical term that he uses. The methodology is what, where you actually specify what the uses are, what, what programs within the, the parks it's going to fund, what, what types of projects, whether it's going to be for just regular day-to-day -day maintenance, um, or whether it's going to be for the, the deferred maintenance, and you, you list those projects and the approximate cost of those, whether it's going to be for other, other things within the parks, um, the ideas even been kicked around heard from Michelle about the swimming pool. The idea has been kicked around that we do a part of the methodology towards um, paying for some of these additional projects that we still want to accomplish at the pool and whether that would be a good use of that. You can, you can look at all those things. But it, when you get into, as you develop that, it gets very specific. And so you'll, that's what, Ted, what you're saying, Brian, what you're asking, that's exactly what this process will be um, creating as those type, that type of information. And then you start to prepare that information, and that brings brings you to like recommendations, and, and then you get into the discussions of you know, what people feel like they want to support. And what so a lot of conversations will happen around this if it if it does go forward. Okay. Um, other general business. Got one thing. Anybody else has something first? Don't worry. Um, one thing that's not on your agenda, uh, we talked at the last meeting in the executive session about a potential property acquisition uh, adjacent to West Leland Park, the opportunity that we had to purchase about an acre and a half. And that has uh, come that, that has come to fruition pretty much exactly as what we had discussed in our executive session. The, um, the recommendation for the commission to basically to approve our purchase and sale agreement for that is going to be on the their agenda next Wednesday night. Uh, so a week from, uh, week from yesterday. So that will be on the agenda as a, that will not be in an executive session, that will be in their, their regular uh, open agenda, open meeting agenda. And they'll be, they'll be asked to, they'll be recommended uh, to approve that purchase and sale agreement. So I wanted to just let you know that that's, that has, as we, that would be the case. It's continued forward, and, and uh, basically all the conditions and terms and everything that we had discussed before are, are what they are. That information is not the, the, the terms and conditions are not quite public. They probably will be by tomorrow because that's when our city commission agenda for the next week gets released, and then of course all the staff reports with all the detailed information get released in those um, agenda announcements. So by tomorrow, all the all the details of that will be announced. But prefer not to get into like costs and details of the uh, negotiation tonight just because it's not quite been um, made public just yet. But that's what the existing SDCs right. yeah. we purchased with, with our parks SDCs and it's been envisioned that we would acquire some additional property in this area so I think it's a very favorable purchase for us. Yeah. That was just an update to let you know that has gone forward mm -hmm. for that next and I hope that will be approved. Good to hear. We're going to start on my left for track member reports. Steve? I have nothing. Unless that's probably odd. Pat, uh, did you mention this a little bit earlier, but um, along that uh, front, not, I've been up there and seen the progress, and I, I trust that and also that the work was excellent. And, uh, a lot of people commented on this in the past few meetings, but just to kind of echo that, I thought uh, the pace is moving along really good too, and it really looks nice up there. Uh, just to keep you guys in the loop as far as what the uh, the Oregon City swim team itself has been doing to um, obtain the last starting block, the sixth competitive starting block there at the pool, and it has to do with the slide. Either a new slide or moving mood as home, most, most likely a new slide. They actually came to the last commission meeting and made a proposal to the, to the commission to uh, help pay for the slide. And uh, so we're they're moving forward on that. And I'll just I'll keep you guys appraised of that or apprised of that as it, as it goes. But I know. That's all I got. Still too wet for the angle. <laughs> uh, I have a, well, I have a 
bad for anybody else. I also get turned into the bad. I don't recommend it. Recommended. Recommended reading. I didn't recommend it by Steve. Oh, Steve. Yes, it is. Uh, the other thing I have to apologize in advance, I will not be able to attend next month's meeting. I have a business trip out of town that's just unavoidable. Can't be scheduled, so I apologize. I'm sorry that I'm going to miss it. Um, yeah, I was at uh, the Malawi Neighborhood Association meeting with uh, David. Did you catch that? Sacramento. Sacramento. Okay. And uh, he did he did just an amazing job of presenting, um, sharing information about the signage, which I definitely agree is going to really be a nice finishing touch to the to the promenade. Um, and the, he, re he reassured the neighborhood association that it was going to be done very well, very thorough and uh, at a very fine quality. With um, he went into great detail descriptions on um, uh, how it uh, will be vandal proof and uh, how it gets in dust of time weather and that it fits in historically with signage that's currently out. And on a personal note, I have to. Um, I, I'm, Going to have a baby boy in October first, so I'm making announcements. And my wife is uh, already hounding me that I have to. She's joining up for the deep water exercise. I think that's what it's called at the pool. And we we went walking by the the facility there. It's it really is a really cool retro, uh, uh, neat looking building. And I'm glad I'm glad it's been. I'm glad it's been. Um, yeah, I love that design, and I, I can't wait to go swimming there myself when it warms up. It looks awesome. It's retro. Right? Retro. Okay. It is. I meant to mention earlier, too, um, I love the energy efficiency stuff. Uh, I study this with my kids when I do architecture, and so I meant to bring that up. But, the whole how you have this man. I, I read the little article on how you have energy management systems all set up through the through the pool, and uh, look forward to hearing more about how you've built energy efficiencies in to the new fit. So. Okay. Staff reports. Yeah. So, Colin, uh, Denise, to give you a recreation update. Can you get us a also, our camp and start up new swim. This is the first day of camp at River Crescent and it's cool. Um, we also, and I can confirm, the date for the Carnegie Center task force is June 14th. That was right. I misread my email. Uh, River Crest is has the restroom and mechanical rooms are uh, off limits at this point. The structural capacity of the roof is in hazard condition. So we will be delayed in opening the spray park and we're estimating and indicating that it's most like. With the weather the way it is, I don't know that we're really going to impact a lot of people yet. But, you know, if the weather turns, we'll definitely be hearing complaints. But if you guys are out and about, if you could pass that along, we're trying to move on the roof as soon as possible. We've got a contract with the As soon as we can get that ready to go, we'll be in there um, and packed and ready to go. If there's any confusion on why the restroom holds up the spray park from opening, it's because our mechanical room is in that same building that operates the spray park. And it's, it's a safety issue for us right now. We don't really can't have anybody in there. It kind of got, it, 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 again, talking about the deferred maintenance stuff, this is one of those kinds of items that, that would probably be discussed within that. But we can't use the mechanical room to get the park up and going until we get that roof um, safety issue. But does anybody have anything to do with that progressing of the roof? It doesn't, it doesn't. We have... Um, to climb up there and they plug up that drain. And so when it plugs, it holds three to four inches of water. Is 
in decline already, but the constant hold of water has um, progressed its decline a lot further and a lot faster to the point it has it. Change that design then? We are changing the design. We're putting a single plant, like a shed roof, on it. So it's a single plant off. We don't have uh, gutters that drain out. Uh, not projecting to have that roof be a permanent structure over a long period of time. The hope is that we'll change that restroom to a capacity that it fits the type of roof of that park. Uh, so that was the original. A really early design, I think 50s, if I'm yeah, not yeah, mistaken. That was unchanged when the spray park went in, yeah. Right, and so the capacity of use. Sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> the capacity of use is outweighing the, the style of the building. Um, in the women's side, it's a single stall, single faucet. In the men's side, it's just a urinal and a um, stall and a faucet. And we probably need three times or four times that capacity for. Sports uh, health yeah. reservations, the spray park, and just the general use of the park. So we're looking forward to developing that concept and getting that underway. Uh, Pioneer Center, if you've gone by the Pioneer Center, we've taken down a few trees. We had some severely declining dead trees. Um, any tree that we take down over six inches in diameter, we have to replace the property. So we're projecting in the fall to replace the trees that we have taken down. There at the Fifth Street side of the building, um, we're going to actually be planting the garden boxes. And so that garden will be facilitating um, actual fresh fruit and vegetables to our Meals on Wheels program and our Not only are we growing our own, we're actually going to be utilizing it. Um, it also is a programming element for us. We can use it as a natural gardening program and um, organic fruits and vegetables. Uh, we're also in the Peace Garden. It's a couple of dying trees have grown out of that Peace Garden area and reached out to the Peace Garden for group. And so they were involved in the decision process. Um, and we've also thrown out some design These tend to overlap and relatively healthy trees eventually will start declining. So we're trying to get them involved in what would be a maintenance program so that they're a vested partner with us, that that peace garden would stay formidable for years to come. Um, <coughs> because those trees are, that we've lost, we'll replace them, but we won't be replacing them in the same area. Action of the canopy. We'll start spreading them out through the properties. Well, you're start seeing some variety of trees, um, heavily maple in that area. Uh, annihilate the entire property of trees. Thank you, Debbie. One of the things I've got for you, uh, the parks, uh, excellent picnic shelter project and dedication. Um, you're all familiar with the, the large picnic shelter that been, has been worked on for quite a while by the Oregon City High School Construction Corps program. That's uh, getting close to completion in the uh, fabulous addition to the park. Once again, that group from the high school has done just an amazing job on that project like they've done on several others, both in Wesley Oil Park and some others. Um, one thing we'll be doing is uh, with that class is, is some type of a of a dedication, maybe even a little barbecue or at least some refreshments or something with the class, and then um, you know we'll we'll try to celebrate and, and, and thank them and recognize them for that. Um, tentatively, that is set for this is very tentative, so write it in pencil. Um, I'm waiting for confirmation on this, and it might the date might jump around June seventh, which is a Monday. Would be on site at the at the shelter, and probably something like around five o'clock. Um, I'll send you a, a confirmation of that when we know for certain it's bouncing around. Just because it's going to be done in time, are we going to be able to do this and that, and you know, getting the 
the, the school group together, and, and you know, that's their final run on the last week or so of school, and they're going to be busy and everything. So, um, but you, uh, you, the crack members, are definitely invited, and love to see you there if you can make it. And, uh, we'll celebrate that project because actually, Pratt had reviewed that. I don't know if you remember seeing some of you weren't on the committee, and but. At the Pioneer Center, we see over there they brought in those big mm-hmm. models with all the sticks and everything. Of this is what we want to develop, and it's, well, it's almost built. And uh, so it's kind of neat to see that all the way from you know the conception. And they they came in and did these really neat presentations to you and said, hey, what do you guys think? And they got some you get, they got some good feedback, I think, from some track members and some staff. And it's really cool. I sort of had a back to the future flashback there when they presented that. When the doc presented his model and he said, Excuse the crew to do this model. For Michael, Michael J. Fox to run in here in a minute, right? So you're going to let us know if that changes the date. Yes. Okay. I'll be done. I'd like to go. Yeah. And then the, uh, the last thing that I have is uh, we did hold our Willamette River Projects ded- dedication that. Kind of was the final grand opening for the um, for the new Willamette Terrace there on the Golden Boulevard, the Johnstone Park, and all the amenities, and then the Willamette River Trail. <clears throat> Last Wednesday, uh, we squeezed it in just before the big rainstorm hit. Uh, I know some of you were there, and appreciate you coming out and attended. Steve <laughs> McAdoo um, attended. That was like close. Oh, yeah. With the rain, it was amazing. We did a tree, a tree planting at John Storm Park, that that and as, as just as we were putting the final bit of dirt in, this was the very last part of the whole two-hour-long ceremony. The rain started coming. It was, it was perfect. <laughs> it was going to rain. That was just great. Right. So anyway, we had a really, really good event. Great turnout. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of speakers, dignitaries, people came and. Um, just it was really it was a really fun celebration to see that we went back and forth from John Storm and walked up the new pathway to the new Willamette Terrace and then we walked back and did the tree planting and um, it was a terrific event. So former PRAC members were there. Former PRAC members yeah. and former city manager even came over from yeah. Central Oregon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was just really neat. Cool. Yeah. 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 yeah, we had a chance to get down there and really experience that. Take it in on a really nice day, but start either at John Storm or, or park by the you know in downtown and walk across um, to the new terrace and do the walk where you actually walk down with John Storm and some of those and then walk back. It, it gives you a, you haven't been able to do that really before, and you could kind of in these crude sidewalks, but it was scary and kind of dangerous and it wasn't pleasant, but now it's just really, really pleasant. But there's no express lane anymore. <laughs> you miss that express lane. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you know, the mayor did bring that up, how that's been one, you know, but she said really nobody really cared that much. Oh, perfect. So, uh, <laughs> I was <laughs> The lane is still there, it's just not dedicated as an express. So you can still go over there and go fast. <laughs> anyway, that was. Uh, I don't know where you're We just had a wonderful event, and so thanks for all of your support. That concludes my report. Anything else before we adjourn the meeting? The next meeting is going to be the 24th, and uh, I guess you're going to get back to some when that'll start, or do we have time? Well, we wanted to talk about that right now, just so we can kind of pin it down. Um, it's going to take a few hours to do that, uh, depending on, again, I'm going to, I've got a little bit of some thought in mind about where we might want to go. I, I was looking for feedback from members as to are there some specific areas that you would, would like to see in, in May, may have not had a chance to go there. I know Kanim is definitely on the list, and um, you know I've got some other ideas. But if you have specific ideas, either either let me know right now, or um, give me a phone call or an email or something, and I'll make sure that we get that on the route. But um, we've done this in the past, where we've taken a tour with Prack, and I think we've started it at somewhere around 4:30 or 5 o'clock, and and um, get the tour in before dark. We we'll do a light dinner. We'll bring in like some lunch, catered lunch, dinner, um, catered box dinners or whatever, with some sandwiches. So you can kind of eat, and we can eat and drive, you know, and talk between stops. But uh, really up to you how how much time you want to leave yourself. But I 
if it's doable for folks with your work schedules, uh, I'd say not later than five. And if we could push it back to four thirty, because you don't want to get in a hurry and then have to, you know, kind of run, jump off the, the bus and sort of take a quick look. If you really want to ex explore some of these sites a little bit and ask a lot of questions, we'd, we'd like you know we'd like to leave some time. So, but it's your call what you can do and what you think is. I can see that being a pretty time-consuming event. It mm -hmm. is. It is. Really is. Yeah, we'll pick and choose the right ones and the different mm -hmm. ones for our bus. It might be too early, but but we could maybe roll in some of those areas that would uh, would be topics or areas of, of uh, mention for the, the new fee. I know it's really early in that process, but some of the uh, maintenance that's been deferred. Some of those areas. Well, we can point out some of those. Yeah, those really bad areas of where we need to look at. Some we just started with normal. <laughs> <laughs> I need to. So I, I, I can do 430, but I, it's, I mean, that's pushing it for me. I mean, five, five is easier, but I can I can make 430. Well, the mayor call your boss? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 I, mean, I definitely want to make it, um, I want to make it so that people feel comfortable about the time that you can be there. I really, I mean, I don't want to make it so that you can't be there. So you you know you tell me what what sounds reasonable. You could work in parts too, right? So maybe if someone's showing up late, we can phone call each other and then wind up uh, syncing up. Mm -hmm. If someone can't make it, then we get partial. I can very well get held up, and if I do, yeah, I just catch up with you. Somewhere. You've got my cell number, and you can just call and see where we're at. So it, I don't know what you, you want to four thirty side, or you want me just to pick a time. No, I'm five o'clock with you, me. Or do you want to make it four thirty? You want to make four thirty? You work, Marty? Yeah, I have like four jobs. You know. <laughs> well, I just did. Let's just say it. Well, we start with we can start with five. Oh boy. And as we <laughs> build the itinerary, or whoever you know, then we can as we. Give that input, and we look at that itinerary and the feasible times that we spend at each location. We could say, well, this is doable or not doable based on drive time, and, and suggestions to, to add more time or whatever. I'll, I'll put together a draft of, of the itinerary to kind of figure out what we can do, and then I'll send that out and look for feedback. You know, that you can tell me add these things onto the list or take some. You know, we don't need to do that one, so take it off the list or whatever. Kind of work towards that, and if it looks like we need more time, then we can. You know, it sounds good. I, I would recommend uh, that that new property up all the way through high school. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. That hidden. Actually, we have two new properties: one in Silver Run off of Central Point, the smaller neighborhood park. Um, all the blank books. Okay, too many people know about that, so we'll make sure that we hit that one. Well, yeah, yeah, I had had planned on hitting those are future development that crack will be. Involved in helping kind of design and develop and so forth. Okay, all right, great. That's okay. That's good direction for me. I can work, I can work awesome. on that. Okay, let's adjourn the meeting then. If uh, there's no further comments, at um, eight fifty.